My name is Martin Kavanagh. I'm here on James Hanley's farm in Horse and Jockey. We're doing a, we've got a, a panel of farmers and experts talking about what EBI has delivered to us in Ireland. And the people we've with us, we've got uh, Seamus Hughes from Progressive Genetics, a breeding advisor and farmer. We have Robert Hovenden, who's a farmer from Doro. We have Michael Ryan, a farmer from Cashel, just down the road here. We have George Ramsbottom from, from Chagas, who's got extensive experience of working with EBI since, since, in, since its infancy, I think, George. And we have Owen McCarthy from Kilorglan, uh, um, a dairy farmer also. So uh, our panel is on EBI delivering for Irish farmers. But first, we're going to get some background on the systems in use on this farm and advice from our panel. I'm here with George Ramsbottom and we're talking about the contribution of EBI to our dairy industry. George, where has EBI brought us as a dairy industry? So if we look back over the 20 odd years I've been involved, Martin, uh, we can see tremendous changes taking place. Back around 2000, herd average milk solids yield was around 300 kilos of milk solid and calving interval close to 400 days. And now, on a national basis, we're looking at a calving interval of around 375 days and the milk solid yield north of 400, heading for 450. So there's been tremendous uh, change genetically in the industry. We reckon it's worth about a billion euros to, to dairy farmers over the last two decades. How is EBI viewed internationally? So EBI is viewed in a very positive light internationally. We see many other countries expressing an interest in purchasing Ireland's genetics at this stage. And I suppose the reason behind that is it's a very balanced index. It brings a lot of factors along. Just not, it's not just about milk. There's increasing recognition of the value of fertility and other traits as well. And the EBI encapsulates all of those traits in the one index. How is EBI linked into the sustainability of the Irish dairy system? So if you look at it from a sustainability perspective, the big issues that come in under sustainability are efficiency of milk production, which is captured admirably in the, in the EBI. And secondly, the core value that's there around fertility. And we know that it costs X amount and there's X amount of carbon tied up with getting a heifer into the milking parlour in the first place. And having fertility in the index ensures or helps to ensure that they stay around the farm for longer. And the longer they stay around the farm, the more you're diluting those heifer rearing costs. So we've three main factors. We've longevity, fertility, production. These are the factors driving sustainability. There are three huge drivers of it as well. And I suppose another factor that's captured in the EBI, Martin, is the whole health sub-index. So that's becoming more and more to the fore now. So because cows are lasting longer, we need them genetically to be more healthy. And that's captured in EBI as well. George, if we're looking at marginal farms with lower EBI and they need to get uh, or breed their herd into a higher EBI position, what are the steps these farms need to take? Well, Martin, probably the fastest way to really turn around a herd is probably to buy in high genetic merit stock, high EBI heifers. Just to give you an example of a herd that's done it, we had a look a few years ago at a herd who had effectively turned over all of his cows in one year, sold practically everything and bought in very high EBI stock. The EBI of the herd changed from around 70 to around 160. Now this is going back a few years, so they were, at the time they were in the top 10% nationally. In doing so, the first thing he noticed was that his meal bill went down because all of a sudden he had less meal to feed because he wasn't milking through the winter. The cow's fertility had improved. But what, what really jumped out at him was, for his 120 cows, the milk check that he got in total was another 80,000, it was worth 80,000 more to him at the end of the year compared to the previous year with the lower EVI herd. So it just goes to show that through a combination of you know, better quality milk and better fertility, profit, the milk check you get is going to go up substantially. How does fertility improve our milk solids production? How fertility drives the increase in milk solids, Martin, is through increasing the number of days that farmers are seeing in milk production in their herds. So instead of having maybe 60 and 100 cows calved at the end of February, they'll have 90 cows calved at the end of February from the same starting date. So those extra 30 or 40 cows calved in the month of February, those cows are milking through to the end of November. So the milk solids from fertility is coming from days in milk. And we can see that all around the place. For herds that, that are apprehensive about having um, a high calving rate or a lot of compact calving, what's the length of time it's going to take to improve EBI? 
I'd say the first thing they should do is talk to their neighbours who are operating a higher EBI system and see how they're managing to bring their herds along and adapting to the demands that are there for calving and compact calving in the spring. We wouldn't encourage anyone to, to jump into very compact calving unless they have the system ready for it, so they have the accommodation for the calves, they have the outlets for the calves that are going to be sold off their farms. But they can, they can also breed themselves into it over a number of years. So not change over the herd in one year, but change over the herd in three or four years and work the way into it slowly. And it will, it will pay benefits in the long run. What's the minimum EBI we would look at when we're breeding replacements? As a rough rule of thumb, Martin, when you're trying to select, look at cows around 150 EBI. And those cows, particularly the ones that calved and have a good interval between when they calved and when they're being bred, they're the cows you'd be targeting for the top EBI bulls that are available to breed the next generation of heifers. So if we stick at a figure of around 150 EBI, beef the ones that are below that, you've, you'll have maiden heifers and you've some high EBI cows to breed the next generation from. And the quality of the stock that'll come from those is really, really good. How long, George, will the increase take, roughly? I'd say it'll take, it'll take a seven year period on an average farm to, to jump by around 100 EBI but you can do it, it will happen. George, for cows that are not hitting the minimum EBI to breed replacements from, how are we going to get a calf of value from these cows? Okay, so to breed those high value beef calves from the Martin, what we're looking at is we're looking at the DBI, the dairy beef index, to select the bulls that we're going to use. And there's two components to it. There's a dairy side of it, we're looking at the gestation length, and we're looking at the calving ease on that side of it. But secondly, we have the beef merit on it. We've values for carcass conformation and values for carcass weight. And we look at getting a good balance of the two of those and judiciously picking the cows for certain bulls. So you'll pick two or three high DBI bulls and you'll use those across the cows that you're not going to breed for dairy AI. George, tell me about the maintenance sub-index. What's the worry if we make our cows too small? The maintenance sub-index is a very valuable trait. It's a really, really good predictor of the mature cow live weight. So we looked at data uh, in the database that we had and what we found is that Around 590 kilos uh, live weight, that will equate to a maintenance sub-index of around 10. And that's a mature cow, a cow in her third lactation at 150 days in milk. So if we choose, cow, if we choose bulls with a, a much higher maintenance sub-index, they'll actually breed smaller cows. Most farmers will look at breeding cows that are around 50, 10 to 15 euro for maintenance sub-index. And that's giving them a modest sized cow somewhere between 590 and 565 kgs. Those are a medium sized cow, but they'll also throw you know, acceptable quality Frisian cattle for the beef market as well, that are re relatively easy finished and have a decent carcass weight. So George, we're not looking at something that's either too high or too low in terms of maintenance. But the very high maintenance of index cattle, uh, they, kill too, they kill very light and they're not really something that the market is going to require in the long term. It's something in a kind of a medium band we're looking at, Martin, to be honest. George, how important is it that we get our replacements calved early in the season? So ideally what we're looking for with the heifers that we're breeding, the next generation of calves, in an ideal world you'd like to see them all calved by the end of February because it gives them a really strong chance of calving themselves at two years of age. And not enough of our heifers are currently calving at two years of age, so there's a good scope for improvement there as well. And one part of it is having those heifers calved, those heifer calves born nice and early in the calving season, so they get every opportunity to calve down themselves two years later in the spring, in early spring. We're going to have some high EBI cows that are calving late. Uh, what are, what's the best decision to make with these, George? I, I'm afraid, Martin, it's kind of going to be tough love for most of those cows. In terms of breeding, I'd say it'll be beef will be the choice for most of them, unless they resume cyclicity and are bred in the first three weeks of the breeding season or that, I'd be putting them to beef. I don't think I'd be using a dairy AI on them because the heifers will be born too late to give us a, a good run at getting them in calf to calve themselves at two years of age. So I'm down here with James and Trevor Hanley. Uh, lads, thanks for having us down on the farm. Uh, James, it's your farm. Trevor, he's your cousin. <laughs> James, uh, would you give us a, a little bit of a background about what you're doing here? Okay, we're here today. Um, we've a split herd here uh, between 60% spring and 40% uh, uh, autumn uh, milk. And we, we supply um, Centenary Taurus Tipperary Fresh Milk. We're milking 300 plus cows here. Um, uh, they were British Frisian base and we're, we're uh, introducing the EBI high profile bulls to... Um, uh, 
for fertility, but to, the whole side of it up to up the um, the, the anti on them like um, fat and protein. The milk and well, I mean, they're, they're, you're you're getting a more milkier cow into the herd, uh, mm. and I suppose you're using all the tools available. And Trevor, that's kind of where you come in with. Yeah, the see, traditionally it was a British fishing base herd, and then in the past 15 years we introduced a higher EBI to. Uh, Lift up the fat and protein and the fertility. Higher EBI Holstein bulls? Higher EBI Holstein yeah. bulls. The herd is split, as James said, 40% in the autumn and 16 in the spring. And uh, the kind of cow we're going for is a 7,000 kilo cow with a 575 kilos of milk solids, 3.6, 3.7 protein, and 4.5. 4.4 fat. And just getting them in calf and then changing the cow type and Trevor you mentioned the really good solids that you're managing to do. Yes exactly and like a maintenance figure of around 10 to 12 because like see it's important here for for James and the guys to have a, a, a beef unit is important coming off a dairy cow as well so I could therefore we want a, a strong cow a 600 kilo cow. So, so, so two questions on that how are you getting there so quickly you are using sex semen? Yeah we use sex semen and like, um, the profile would be for the autumn time would be a high volume bull is being used with the emphasis as well on fertility and the emphasis on fat and protein kilos. And, like, uh, and then for the springtime, we go with uh, a lower milk volume bulls and like, uh, higher fat and protein percentages and again higher fertility. We're chasing fertility the whole time because fertility drives on production and we're chasing that. And now with the sex semen program like, uh, coming in for the heifers, we can use, uh, we can match mate the bottom part of the herd for the beef bulls. And like, uh, we were using Hereford, some Angus, and then like, uh, all the Frisian bull calves are kept. So, uh, James, you're using sex semen. Yes. Are you going to focus your replacement solely then on your heifers and breed more beef into your cows? Is that, that the plan? Well, that, that's what we start now at the moment. Like, but I'd say the next year or two, we might focus on maybe the cows as well. Like, you know, yeah. Just, uh, and just a, a quite like, <coughs> not too many dairy farmers are going dairy to beef. So you're following a beef calf the whole way yes. from start to finish. finish yes. Yeah. What are you looking for for a beef calf? And for dairy farmers who are using beef, what do you want to see as a beef finisher as well? Mm -hmm. As in like what, what type of like Hereford, Angus, yeah, well, like what, what, what are the traits yeah, you well, guys well, should well, be looking for? What we do for? is, depending on, on the prices, they're sold in the mart or the factory, yeah. or is to go to the factory, depending on the price. Yeah. And they're averaging around 225 a kilo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So say if they're, if they're uh, being sold at 535, 600 kilos, they make 1,300 euros. 1,300, yeah, that's yeah. usually we average it out, yeah. Yes, so no, no, put blade enough, this is a big operation. To run it, you obviously need manpower. Yes. How are you, how are you managing with that? How are you focusing on the yeah. labour? Well, myself and my, my brother here together, like, we're in a partnership, and um, we, we work very well together, like, and we have three full-time uh, labour units, like, and um, unfortunately, two of the lads now are going travelling this year, like, you know, yeah. so it's just replaced them, like, but yeah. I do, I do, like, with anybody that works here, like, you know, it's a very friendly environment. You know, there is no hardship, like, and we like to kind of work at office hours, like, you know, and very basic weekends and stuff. And I think that is one of the key questions that labour is the, you know, when, when people are looking at this, like, that is the key thing, like. Something that helped you labour around breeding, you tried synchronising uh, yes. there in the autumn. Yes. How did it go? Went very well now, we're very happy with it, like, you know, it's, I mean, it was an eight day programme, like, you know, but, in fairness to Trevor now, he was involved with me because of my first time in it, like, but we had all our heifers in pre, pre, pristine condition for it, like, you know, they're in top class form. Yeah, and the weights were probably, I, I want 350, 360 kilos, they were weighing that kind of weight. Yeah, weights, And like, uh, they were in very good condition. And also, like, uh, lots of minerals being used, and yeah. uh, up to fertility, a set program for yeah. eight days. And tell us, what would you advise, so the lads aren't sitting on the fence, what would you advise them? I, I'd advise try it. Like you have to, you know, life moves on and everything in farming circles is moving on as well and you have to try these things. All technologies and this is the technology yeah. I see like it's like with all these animals with the heat time that we use for the for, for, the, for uh, heat detection like you know we're using it 15 years there now and I couldn't go away from that and now it's like the sex yeah. semen we have to up our game like you have to make yeah. life. And you've been advising guys that like, to use AI as well because like uh, AI does add value to her like you're going to uh, you're going to be 80 to 100 points in EBI higher with your AI than you are with a stock bull. Yes, yeah. that's, that's one example. And also, like uh, e the higher EBI elements would add four to three cents a litre to your milk value as well. So, like uh, for that case, is perfect. I suppose where where do you see the herd now in in five years time? What what are you aiming for? Well, personally, like we we would we'd love to numbers is a big thing is we, we'd love to pop another you know we can we have the land base the, the base to do that but at the moment it's it's a labor 
Dave is the big thing for me. Yeah. Out out of everything, you know, that's the big Just thing secure and good people. Secure and good people and just having the know that you having the backup. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Lads, listen, thanks a million for having us down. Thanks for having us for the day, uh, James and, and Trevor. Thank you. Very welcome, lads. Thank it's you. It's great, great to right. see us. So I'm here with Seamus Hughes. Seamus, you're a jack of all trades. You're a dairy farmer and you also work with PG. Maybe tell us about your role in PG and what kind of farm you're running at home. Yeah, well, first of all, George, I'm also overawed to be interviewed by you at all, to be honest <laughs> with you. The first time I saw you myself, my wife was sitting down in the, sit in the sitting room looking at you on first dates. So oh, right. And ever, si ever since then, you've become a bit of a celebrity in the farming world. But yeah, I am a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, I'm from North Wexford. I started in PG, would you believe, 26 years ago. And the environment was totally different then in terms of what we were looking for, in terms of breeding, etc., etc. And if, if we're to be honest, we made a lot of mistakes, and including myself and an awful lot of, of the breeding advice that time, uh, when we look back on it now, we were wrong, uh, and, and to, to a large degree. Um, but certainly in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we have seen you know, a revolution in, in making dairy cows and our dairy industry more profitable in Ireland. And a lot of that has come down to getting our genetics right. And uh, you know, it's a collaboration between all the different uh, vested interests uh, in the industry in Ireland uh, since the ICBF started in, in 2000. And you know, lot, some of us were, were dragged into a kicking and screaming um, from the point of view of we wanted our high type cows, our North American genetics, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, look at, we've learned maybe some of us the hard way, but I would say for certainly farmers who are new to the industry now, so much of the heavy lifting has been done. They can make progress now really, really quickly. Uh, considering the type of bulls that's available. So on your home farm, I mean, what kind of change have you seen personally? I went from 40% uh, six-week calving rate um, 12, 13 years ago uh, to 80% last year. Um, we went from, you know, 3.2% protein to 3.6% last year. Uh, we went from uh, less than 400 kilos to 500 kilos of solids. And, and just putting that in context, I'm making 120 cows at home. I think that's worth about 25, 30 grand a year to me. Yeah. And it's a lot of money it's and lot of money. apart from the money, because money doesn't motivate everything, my lifestyle has changed. I have a, I like uh, last year, in the last calving season, and I know I got a bit lucky, but I never had the vet in the yard because of a more robust cow, a more fertile cow and a cow that's easier to handle. And what, what's the best way for me to kind of maybe decide what, uh, what bulls to use and what cows? If I picked out the bulls I want, where do like you know sire advice is obviously you're going to say, but like how does that work and why is it even effective at all? Well, sire advice is very effective, but first of all, I think it's really most farmers either don't have the interest or the expertise to look at all those bloody numbers on a catalogue and figure out what bull is for them. So I would say to them if it, to, to do anything as regards taking some advice. There's two key numbers here. One is the milk or production subindex, right? And that's your A plus B minus C ranking. Okay, yes. that's your payment system, and that'll, it'll put all the values in. And, and just, just, just to clarify that, sorry for interrupting you, A plus B minus C, fat plus protein minus milk. Exactly. Yeah. So we rank the bulls based on the way we're paid for bulls, and yeah. that's your milk or production subindex. It also takes into consideration the value of protein over fat, which is very important, right? So production subindex is, is one real uh, important criteria. I'm saying 90 to 100. So anything less than that, just throw them out, okay? okay? The second one is fertility, because without fertility, you don't get production, because they won't calve down early enough, and they won't stay around long enough. So fertility equals production, and I'm saying 150 on that. So 100 on milk subindex, 150 on fertility subindex, and I'm really confident that you'll breed a really profitable herd of cows by just doing that. And now I just want to say, for guys that are maybe milking at home, they're running four or five stock bulls, they're having a good condensed calf, and they've never used AI. What do you say to them? They're, they're thinking about it, but they're just afraid to make that leap. What are you going to say to them to encourage them? Uh, well, look, at the first thing is it's their herd of cows, it's their lifestyle, and it's their farm, and let them do it. whatever they feel, feel is right for them, that's fine. But if they're in the business of making life, first of all, easier for themselves in terms of more compact calving, and if, in the, if they have a young family and maybe uh, an heir or two coming up to take over the farm, they'd like to leave them in inter, an, a business that's very efficient and very profitable uh, going, going into the future. And like, uh, like it was mentioned earlier on, like versus the average, the guys who are just doing a reasonable job in breeding, 
like three, four, five cent a litre over the average. That's yeah. a hell of a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose it's Seamus. Uh, just finishing off, I'd like to say thanks a million, uh, first of all, for taking the time to talk to us. And lastly, just again, to drill home the facts, what's your go-to uh, advice for lads this breeding season? Where do you, what do they need to do? What's your advice for them? Okay, let's, for keeping, keep it simple. Uh, Munster or Progressive will do Desire Advice for you. Ver Desire Advice is a mating program, we can do it online, and it does an inbreeding check, very important. So we can do that for you. Second thing is, uh, in terms of our fresh panel of bulls, we've already picked a panel of 12 bulls that reach 100 on production sub-index and 150 on fertility sub-index. All you really need to, need to do here, George, is call the AI man. Okay, <laughs> shame assistant, thanks a million. Okay, thanks George. Cheers. My name is Martin Kavanagh. I'm talking to Robert Huffington today um, about his farming system in Doro. Robert, tell us a little bit about your farming system. I'm a mainly spring calving dairy farmer. I'm from Doro and Leash. Um, I calve 80% of the cows or 90% of the cows in, in the spring and the, at the, a few empty ones in, in October every year. I, I don't stop milking over the winter and I like to keep my good empty cows, carry them on and they go with the empty cows next year for the winter. But mainly spring, I have calved, there's a hundred cows calved in the last five weeks. Are you farming on your own? I am, unfortunately. Has to be easy to manage cow, has to be simple, as simple cow as I can, as I can have. What's your kilos of milk solids and fat and protein that you're producing? We're, we're in around the 600 kilos at the moment. Like The average fat is 483, 483 okay. and 3.8 protein. The old system that the companies had, the RBI, I didn't agree with it. And I got interested in it from there and I started forming my own type cow that I'd like. And I always looked at the brochures that I get and I go for solids, over milk, solids over milk and fertility. Relating to your choice of the cow of the future, what are the key pieces uh, within the genetics that you're focusing on? I still basically have the same mindset. I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for more. Like I think I think I, I wouldn't settle for where we are. Yeah, we've we've for want of a better way of saying we've cruised in I kind of cruised into where I am like at the moment. And I I'd like to aim for six fifty kilos of solids in the future with the same type cow. What is your main feed base? My feed base is grass mainly, and last year 1.2 tonnes of meal. I, I would always be aiming towards the cow that will work off of grass as best. Like, if you're to say, the best way to describe it is your better cows in the herd are probably the cows that you're looking to the future, like for, if, if you understand what I'm saying, like they're doing the six, 700 kilos, 750, there's even cows doing 800 kilos of solids in the herd, and they're working to the same system, the same feed base, the same, like I don't have special feeders in the milking parlor. Every cow gets the same feed regardless of yield because she's been substituted when she's getting meal. There isn't enough grass. Tell me a little bit, Robert, about why you've chosen uh, to go AI completely. Any cow that has a problem, temperament, feet, anything, I won't, I'll put a beef straw in her. That's the advantage of doing AI you have control over it. Then the rest, I will say there's 85, 90% of the cows, I will put a, a, a Frisian straw in her because if they have a heifer, it's, it's, a good, it's a good heifer, like, you know. And uh, going forward, maybe I might lean a little bit more towards, from my own point of view, of going the, the dairy side of it a little bit earlier, we'll stop in a little bit earlier, like, and finishing up with more, we'll say the beef end of it that I sell all the calves, that they're gone and I'm free of them. Like. What are your goals when you're selecting bulls through AI for your beef system, for dairy beef? What's influencing your choice? My, my goal with the beef system is to supply a calf that's in demand for the, man, for the beef man. I'll be honest with you, I don't know an awful lot about the beef end of it. Like, so I'm kind of just going on, on what, what I think is right. Like the beef side of the, my my enterprise is all about me ha not having hardship. So like if the beef bull doesn't, so if he if he's causing me that, he won't be, I won't be using him. Like you know, so so Cavanese is absolutely essential. 
I don't, I don't want to be getting up in the middle of the night to calve cows, to pull calves out of cows. And I have, as, uh, as of now, I have 100 cows calved and I have been in the yard about four times this year during the night. Tell me a little bit about your heat detection system. My heat detection system is tail paint. Uh, you also use some vasectomized bulls? I do. I have two, two teaser bulls for, to go with the heifers and they might come back to the cows, but in general, I don't bring them home to the cows now. I just use the paint, tail paint. When you're milking the cows twice a day, the ta if the, ta the tail paint is gone, it's a no-brainer. Why don't you use stock bulls? My honest answer is, a, a long time ago, I thought the, the worst AI bull is better than the best stock bull. And I've never lost that, and, and I just, I can't go back to a bull. I just couldn't, it's not in me to do it like. Can you give us some advice on what you could have done better uh, in, in your journey to get to where you are today? Well, you, I don't think you can be too good at the grass. That's my honest opinion. I think we have a lot to learn still on, on the manure side of things and all that, but no matter what's happening, it has to still, grass has to still be the number one in, the, in my system anyway. Explain to me, Robert, why you're not choosing milk volume or milk volume is not the major criteria that you're selecting for um, AI in your bulls. Well, again, it's back to, this is purely my own theory, but if the bull is producing 300 kilos of milk extra to get the solids, mm. that's not the answer to the problem for me anyway. What I like is the bull that, if he is producing a positive, let it be a small positive, with a big solids percentage in his, in his heifers, we'll say, and that, well, in my head anyway, that has to be bringing up my solids. And the proof is in my, my herd at the moment. Like I've done it since I left school. Like I have had this, this theory and I've gotten to where I am, like doing what I'm doing. So like, I think I must be doing something right. That's basically the size of it. I have no control over the co-op price of milk. but I have control over the extra cent or five cent or 10 cent that I can get for the solids which at the moment is, I, my, my base price last year was 45 cent for milk. So that's the 10 cent there from Glanby or the 9 cent from Glanby. That's the important money to me. That's the money I have control over. It's there for me to get if I'm good enough to get it out of the, the, the system. Okay, so we're here with Michael Ryan of Dean's Grove Cashel. Um, Michael has been a uh, dairy farmer uh, for 20 years after taking over from his dad. So Michael, you've seen a lot has uh, changed over the last 20 years. Um, in terms of lifestyle, uh, what has changed for you? Well, I would have been fortunate for my own uh, dad. We, we always had greyhounds, right? So we always tried to be finished in the evening at half five. That was it. We used to go greyhound racing. I was rare uh, going greyhound racing. So, that's how, so farming had to suit what we did in the evening time. So yeah, we get finished every evening for half five. We start every morning at half six. And that cow, she works for me. I don't work for her. Okay, Michael, uh, at this stage, you're getting very close to the end of your calving season. And like in terms of how the calving season has evolved over maybe the last two decades, uh, what has changed for you as regards your calving season and the amount of labor, etc., cetera, that, uh, that's required during that February, March uh, season? Well, I suppose the, the fertility that we've gained from using EBI over the last 20 years, gone away from the big, huge volume Dutch bulls that we would have had in the past, right through the middle oats for you, but her ability to go back in calf was a lot more difficult. Now, with EBI, she's going back in calf with good fertility, so therefore we have compact calving. So you have a very, very busy February. We try and get as much help as we can on board, let it be students from the local school, it might be Chaga students, family help, whatever it is, we get as much help as we can in the month of February, that first six weeks. And once we do that, we've compact cab and we've a, a, a one group of heifers that are coming on to rear. And like, we have seasonal. So February, March is calving. Then the breeding season starts off at the end of April, the last week of April into May. That's the breeding season. Once that's over, so we've kind of, there's a structure to the year. We're not just calving cows all the time. We're not rearing calves all the time. It gives man and beast an opportunity to, to do what they should do at the right time of the year. So again, we're getting back to the whole labor issue and this intense workload in February, March, but you were calving down 150 cows in, in, in that time. In reality, Michael, how many cows are you actually really calving down? I, I bench a lot of things on how often I have to get up in the night time. Now I have a calving camera, right? So I, I go to bed usually around half 10 and I check it again at three o'clock or half three. 
I try nighttime feed, I try different things to avoid them calving in the night time. But generally, I turn on the camera at three o'clock and I might see a calf running around the shed. I don't, I get up in the morning and go feed that calf. I don't have to get out of bed. I, if I see two legs coming, I'll set it again for half an hour, an hour later, and if the cow should calve herself. I don't have to get out of bed to calve, to calve a cow. I did this year once, I'll tell you why, because my camera wasn't working. And that was it, that was the only reason I got up this spring. I was only up once this spring, and that's the actual fact. I usually, on average, get up two times every spring, and that's because cows are easier calving. We have good genetics, we've, I don't, when I'm picking the bulls that I want, I try and avoid uh, anything that's like six, seven, eight, nine percent on difficulty for calving. So I use the facts and figures to support what I'm doing. But in general, high EBI bulls are, in general, are easy calving because you've got genetics upon genetics upon genetics will, will are breeding just easier to, to manage animals. Now an easy calving, uh, an, an easy calving calf that's born doesn't necessarily mean that she's going to be a small animal. It doesn't work that way. She just, she's a shorter gestation, a smaller animal, easier to manage. And when she hits the ground, it's my job to mind her after that. Michael, just, just want to touch on something maybe that's uh, getting more fashionable, and that's the use of technology in dairy farming. And sometimes when you talk about technology, a lot of farmers get scared because they feel that it's uh, alien to them. But I, I'm talking in terms of technology like uh, farm software, like microcarton, and even EBI being a technology. Can you maybe just describe how that has helped you over the last number of years to get where you want to get to? I'm very interested in anyway. Okay, I'm interested in breeding anyway. That's the first and foremost. It actually comes to me easy. It's like towards, the, we were talking about crops now, tillage and barley, wheat, oats. I, I did that in college and I struggled. But when it comes to genetics and, and animal science, I just like it anyway. EBI is a work in progress. I think that's what farmers have to understand. It's a work in progress. It's changing all the time. The more data and information that we put into that, let it be a lame animal, a cow with mastitis, whatever, uh, temperament. We get these uh, at the end of every year, at the back end of the year, December, early January, we get out sheets in the post from the ICBF. It takes you five minutes to fill them out. We'll say, was it her? For, from a temperament point of view, we just put a ring around it and there's a free post envelope to send it back. I encourage every farmer to do that. If we don't give the information, we can't, we can't get the best bulls that are going to become available to us. We all have a walking computer in our pockets at the moment. On my phone, I hardly ever turn on a laptop now. I do it pretty much all through the phone. So I do all my registrations for the calves. I, I, I take part in the D, I, D, uh, DNA program as well. So I do all the registrations through the phone. I do, I do all my grass management through the phone. And pretty much uh, all those aspects. If it's a lame animal, I, I'll put in our, our freeze brand onto the phone because it's connected to the ICBF. And it's just all that information is going to serve me well down the road. So they're the kind of things that I use like, to, to make my life way, very much easier. Uh, Michael, then just to talk about the breeding plan, and again, it's something that um, some farmers feel is complicated and some people actually make it complicated. But how can this be made very, very simple in terms of uh, utilizing tools like Sire Advice, and the ordinary microcording reports that you can find on your farm software. Yeah, well actually I should have mentioned in the previous point about milk recording. So like if I have a cow, right, I can look up that cow's number, put it into my phone, I put it, go into the, the, the farm package that I have, I can put in the number of that animal and I can press the milk icon on it and I can look it up to see has she issues from the year before. It takes me seconds. So when I look her up, Okay, I can go along when I'm making a breeding plan and I can say, pick out the 30 cows in my herd, the, 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 the one-fifth of the herd that I don't want to breed after. That's the most important thing I need to do before the breeding season starts, is say to myself, well, I don't want to replace them without a her. Has she a temperament problem? Has she a somatic cell count problem? Is she lame? Has she a lameness problems? You know what, like the reality is, if her mother was lame before her, she'll be lame as well. If her mother had a cell count problem before her, she'll have a cell count problem. It's just genetics. You know what I mean? You are the, the, the progeny of your parents and that's the reality. So those choices are easily made. So the first thing you do is say is, what do I not want to replace them off? And they're very easy to find. So if you have your AI technician coming into the yard to AI your stock, well, it's very important. You have a chart up in the wall, just write up your 20 or 30 or 40 cows, whatever you don't want to breed off of. They're up in the wall. Technician, when he or she comes into you, straight away you say, well, that animal gets a beef bull. Let it be an Angus, a Hereford, an Albrecht, whatever breed you want. Look at your catalog. It doesn't really matter when it comes to the beef breed. Pick your beef breed and that's fine. But don't breed off of them. That's the most important thing you do if you want to keep things simple. Now we're getting very technical and you want to match up with a cow with, low, with say low protein and low fat or whatever it is. You can go along and really get down to the nitty gritty of which ones you want to pick. Now, wing breeding is, a, is, is very simple to do. The sire advice does that for you. It's very straightforward. Pick out the bulls that you want. Or the, when Progressive or our Monster AI are coming into you, Monster Bovine are coming into you, that's done for you straight away. They just put the number into the machine and the inbreeding is covered straight away. So you have no stress to worry about there whatsoever. And like with the Fresh program, 
and with the conventional seam and our sex seam for that matter, it's very simple to do. They, they'll pick them out for you, or if you're doing it yourself, give it a bit of time, pick out your panel of bulls, spend that bit of time there uh, around now, around St. Patrick's Day, March, into the, into the end of March. Give it a little bit of time, a couple of hours of the morning, not in the evening when you're tired after your day's work. Do it in the morning, get your jobs done, say to yourself, I want to do this now between now and, and maybe dinner time. Give it that two or three hours, it'll put money in your pocket. Okay, Michael, look, at all of this has to make sense and it has to add to the bottom line at some, some stage. So in terms of how much more profitable you are from when you started off, uh, how have things progressed as regards that? Has this been worthwhile? Well, I always look at my I supply dairy oil. I always look at the milk statement and I always look at the average milk price. I don't look at the bottom 10%. I look at the average milk price and I look at my milk price. But I'm always two and a half to three cents above the average milk price. Now, I supply very close to a million, a million litres of milk. That's 30,000 euros more than I'm making to do the same work as you're doing. Well, look, that pays for an extra person to work on my farm. It pays, I have a woman working at home at the moment. That goes a long ways to paying her. It gives me an opportunity for my young family to do things with them. It gives me an opportunity to have a hobby, let's say play a game of golf, go to a hurling match, go for a run, do what I want to do. I have an extra person there once we get out of the spring. She can go along and manage the cows. For example, the AI season. She's in the parlour. As the cows are coming out and they've been drafted out, I'm AIing them. So when the AI season, when, when, when I'm doing the AI, when the milking is finished, the AI is finished. We're not going along and spending another hour after milking doing the AI. They're all both things are done together. We both can go away and have our breakfast at the same time. And it's not a big long morning. So the extra money I'm making is allowing an extra labor unit on my farm for her to have a, and, and she's not under pressure, I'm not under pressure. So it's a win-win situation. That's where I'm winning. Like I'm making more money out of the better quality cows that I have. So Michael, um, you're lucky to be a part of a very elite group of farmers um, in terms of that you've got a number of bulls into AI over the last number of years, one being Dean's Grove Sadio. Uh, how does that make you feel? I'm sure it's something that's, that you're very proud of. Well, it's very, look, it is great. There's no doubt about it. Like, it is great to look up the catalogue or look up the, the, the information on the internet and see the bull there and see how many progeny that hits the ground uh, as time goes on. It's, it's just a great pat on the back. It's a nice feeling to it. What can you do? Breed the best with the best and hope for the best. I'm here with Owen McCarthy from Milltown, near Kilorgan. Near Kilorgan. Is, is that reason we've been yeah. saying you're from Kilorgan the yeah. whole time? You have a very interesting herd, Owen. Your EBI is knocking in around 188, one and a half cent above the average mill price in, in your in your co-op last year. Even though you're you're on a fixed price, you've made huge strides. T tell me a little bit about your journey. I, I suppose I, I started farming in the early 90s, and we would have been in an RBI system, Martin. So. Uh, once EBI came in and, and, and brought into the whole aspect of uh, the fertility of the herd, I followed that journey fairly hard. It was something that ticked an awful lot of boxes for our farm. So we followed through with the EBI system and there's so much that's tied into it. Like it's not just a one fix. Like, you know, you have your reports that go with it, your milk recording, you have your fertility reports, you have your, 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 your co herd health reports, and they're all very beneficial to your EBI. So we would have followed through on it. Um, prior to that, we would have been finishing beef cattle on the farm. So one thing that may have benefited our herd is in the RBI system, we would have been picking cows, bulls that were positive in body condition score because they were easier to finish them. That actually was a benefit to EBI because once EBI came in, them condition scored animals were actually more fertile. Yeah, they had a higher fertility. They had a higher sub fertility. Yeah. Now, I suppose the other thing we do on the farm you're, to benefit your own natural advantage is we only breed for three to four weeks of freezing. So we're breeding our most fertile animal all the time. Not only was EBI working, but the animals we were keeping on the herd and breeding on the herd were the best animals anyway. So you're inadvertently, you're really, Correct. so you're hitting that, hitting into almost 90% compact calving Correct. rate now. Yeah. So if we back up the truck a little bit and someone watching this saying, oh look, I don't know what my EBI is. I don't know where I'm at. These guys, what they're talking about is, you know, I, I can't get my handle. Wait, where's the start? How do we start knowing what's going on in terms of EBI in the herd? Initially start with your milk recording. Okay. You'll ha if you are milk recording or if you aren't, seriously consider it because at least you'll know where you're standing with your own herd. Out of your milk recording, you will be able to pick your better animals. Your better animals on percentages. It's not all about volume. We'd be more the opposite. We don't like too much volume. Okay. What we'd always prefer is to get our 510 or 
from a mature cow, probably 550 kilos of milk solids, from a cow that's not giving you too much volume. Because if, if you have a cow milking 7,000 litres and a cow milking 6,000 litres and the two of them are producing 530 kilos of milk solids, the cow producing the 7,000 7, litres, she has to work a lot harder to give and you, you an extra. And you've got to feed her, you've got to feed, got to feed, her feed that more. volume. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So that's where we aim on the percentages. And the fertility is a huge amount of that. If she calves, there's a good friend of mine in Kerry and he always says, if a cow milks for long enough, she'll milk enough. Okay. So if she calves early and milks till she's dry, she'll milk you enough. Okay, so point. my understanding, uh, Owen, is you are a McDonald's flagship farm, is that correct? Correct, we're a flagship okay. farm, yeah. You're looking, put, put on your future goggles, and you're looking into the future. Where do you want to be in, say, 10 years' time? What, what are you looking at? Just take you back a year or two. In the last couple of years, we, we managed to buy a farm that was adjacent to us, so we're making 160 cows this year. That's where we'd like to be, stocked at about two cows to the hectare. Um, selling somewhere from a mature herd if we can get our mature herd at the moment we're at something like 3.7 3.8 lactations per cow because we have increased the herd every year by 10 or 15 cows if we can get to four and a half to five lactations per cow 550 kilos of milk solids sold from a 280 day milking period we are, we are happy we like to calve our cows starting breeding 10 to may we'll start calving somewhere around the first days of february and we have everything dry for Christmas. We'll have everything dry for the 20th of December. You're on about the future. Carbon footprint, no matter how way we want to give out about it, it's coming and it's coming fast. It's with us. Yes. EBI ticks a huge amount of boxes when it comes to the carbon footprint. The actual efficient cow is there. She's there. She's able to do it. She's going back in calf. It's ticking all the boxes. Um, and that's where we want to be going forward. We want a good, fertile animal that's staying in the herd, we're a grass-based farm. We're feeding somewhere in or around 900 kilos a meal, depending on the year. We've, part of our farm is quite wet, it's on the sea level. We're reliant on grass, that's what we do. Grass silage meal, that's it. That's what's coming into the farm. We don't want to be over-reliant on outside imports. Okay, so in the future, this is a self-contained, self self-sufficient farm yeah. with a long-lived cow producing a lot of milk solids. And I hope and you don't mind me saying it on, you will have calves to sell to people who want to absolutely to want to go there. So, so th there's a method and a pathway for people yeah. who mightn't be there at the moment yeah, yeah. to simply transform their Absolutely, herd. yeah. We'd we, 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 we be selling replacement heifers as maidens most years, yeah. We would have them. And I, I, I think there's a, there's a great future um, in farming and the EBI journey, what it has brought people along. Like we came from when we started in the early 90s, we had a 311 protein. Um, we were calving cows from Christmas to June. Mm. To now, we'll calve 90% of the cows in six weeks. Our protein was 372 years ago, it was 366 last year. We can, we can sell 510 kilos of milk solids and feed all the milk to our calves. Yeah, and you can do this at your ease. We can do this at our ease. <laughs>
And these cows in the RBI system were happy enough to do that. So what we wanted to do was try and build a fertile herd. So fertility was a huge thing. And when EBI came out, I could see huge benefits in the fertility <coughs> side of it, in bringing, keeping fertile cows on the farm and breeding the fertile cows. The RBI system never brought that in. So you went from, a, say, a, a, a low calving or a moderate calving rate in spring, and now you've got to a point where, uh, wh what's your calving rate like now? So, yeah, I, I guess back then we would have been, we would have been in the mid-90s, we would have been calving from Christmas till June. Okay. You know, and it would have been the norm. Yeah. Um, we had a percentage protein at 311, and we had a fat at under 4%. Um, I'd say by the end of the 90s and early 2000s, we would have, within our own herd, not buying stock, we would have had calved every cow before we started breeding, which was a challenge. Um, since then, I suppose, through the induction of better management and picking better bulls, our, mm -hmm. our protein at present is at 370, like we'd be doing over 500 kilos of solids with actually less milk than we okay. would have had back then. So producing less volume, less getting volume. A, a better solids constituent. And Robert, you made a point to me earlier on. You're you're working as such, I'm going to say you're working on your own, you're calving down 120, 130 cows, am I correct saying that? Yes, yes. And, and, that, so, and you've gone on that journey as well. Some, some farmers are really worried when they hear that word compact calving, they get apprehensive about it. How's that worked for you? It's hard while it happens, but it eases the rest of the year, like, because you come into the breeding season free of the calving. February, like, is, a, is, is an absolute nightmare month. Whatever way you go about it, there isn't an easy, there isn't a word, simple is a word I hear used. It doesn't exist in dairy farming as far okay. as I'm concerned. Because, like, but once you have it over, then you have the next cycle coming in, at least. But imagine having the two together. So, so you've very clear work elements where you say, okay, I've got everything carved, I'm now moving on to grass, I'm now moving on to breeding. Is that your experience as well, Michael? Well, uh, to bring a point to the year that you brought, when I, 20 years ago I was in college and the farmer of the year, I remember well, had a calving into it on 402 days. Mm -hmm. Now this was a message that rang home to me, but this was just norm in the industry at the time. Mm. And now pretty much all the group here that are involved in farming, we're looking at 365. My own herd now at the moment was 367 last year, it was 366 the year before, so we're holding around 365. Yeah. So that goes with the compact calving. So EBI has served me well on a fertility point of view. Now we focus way more heavily on it now. I'm mm -hmm. way more educated on it, but naturally it brought us there nearly unknowingly over the last 20 years. Okay, so it's, it, it's, so it's sort of a hidden, almost a hidden element to it. And I think you were saying to me, George, that internationally this is, this is viewed very positively. Very, very positive because fertility is, from a sustainability perspective, fertility is so important in terms of retention of animals in the herd, both in terms of survival and in terms of calving interval. Now the content is more in terms of the uh, retention of animals in the herd. So we get more lactations out of the cows that we have, which reduces the carbon footprint of the young stock coming through. Seamus, as a breeding advisor, you come across all types of farms, all types of situations. We're dealing with people who are really operating at the top 10% here. But from the point of view of, of the general person out there, they're looking at EBI, as I say, we might have a certain amount of apprehension. We're talking about the fertility piece. What have you seen in your travels as regards that fertility piece? people getting used to it. Yeah, look, at the, the, the landscape has transformed over the last 10 or 15 years for people who are just even using the fresh semen program. Uh, they don't even have to, in my view, spend a whole lot of time picking bulls or get into a lot of technicals on it. Mm. Um, the, what, what I would say in terms of farmers who are, get, who are new to this and, and maybe should start thinking about using high EBI bulls in the, you know, this season or next season, um, the first thing to, to remember is that fertility, first and foremost, means higher production. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I took even people like us a while to get our heads around that, because they're calving earlier and they're staying around longer. So mm -hmm. if you want to produce more kilos of fat and protein, you first must get your fertility right. And I'd say the advantage they have over all these guys mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. when we started off breeding for EBI and high fertility is that the bulls are so much better now. So they can uh, make far bigger leaps much quicker than mm. maybe a lot, of, a lot of guys around the, the panel here today. So to me, this is not only achievable, it's achievable at a very fast rate. Yeah, I, I think that's really mm. important because I think, and again, we've had that chat, George, is if we have a herd now that is a sub 100 in EBI and we have that reluctance or we've had a tradition and we're worried about milk volume and so on, what sort of time frame are we looking at to flip that herd? and what's What's, what's the best way to do that, do you think? Well, the, the nuclear option for the really low performing herds is the, you sell the herd you have and you buy in high EBI stock. 
and there's any amount of 200 plus EBI heifers available for the mm. auto, it will transform your herd. We looked at there lately at a herd who had gone from 70 EBI, so literally sold out the herd over a couple of years and bought in effectively a brand new herd. The milk checks for the year for 120 cows were up by 80 grand, 80,000 euro or more. And that was just in terms of milk. Feed costs had gone down. Okay. And retention of those cows, empty rate at the end of the season was sub 10%. It completely transformed his herd. My, my co-op, which I supply, is dairy goat, right? Yeah. Mm. And when I look at the milk price that I get versus the average, and I'm not talking about the bottom yeah. 10%, mm. we get two and a half to three cents a litre more than the average. Now, if you're supplying a million litres, which is quite possible, yeah. that's mm. 30,000 euros. That for the same man or woman that's milking the cows, feeding them, I can get that much more than they're getting. I can pay somebody to make my life easier for my yep. family, for myself, for my hobbies, whatever I want to do. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, and just a real strong <laughs> message, Michael, is that is that we're we're looking at the pounds, shillings, and pence in that mill price. It, is that is that the point you're you're yeah, going for? It was from the other side. George mentioned retention. Mm. So if you look at the retention of the animal, it's costing. No, these were the figures before the inflation of everything that has happened in the last yeah. number of months. It was costing 1,540 euro to get a heifer into the milking parlour, yeah. to bring that heifer in. Sure. And she's going to be three quarters of her way through her second lactation before she's paid back to you. So mm. if she doesn't calve down on your farm as a third calver, you've mm. lost money in actually bringing her in. Mm. She's okay. cost you money. So the retention of cows, and, and Michael is dead right in what he said about milk price and milk price will increase you on the EBI, but the actual fertility of keeping them animals in your herd longer, okay. the money is huge, and it's a hidden cost inside in every farm if you have a high replacement rate. That 1,540, and it's probably a lot higher now, I, I don't know what the figure is, but it's a huge figure on farms if you have a plus 20% replacement rate every year. But and Martin this is fitting into our sustainability message, George, is that right? Martin, when we look at the, the national average herd versus the next generation herd in the Kilworth farm mm. at Moor Park, 56% of the <coughs> next generation herd calf for the fifth time. That mm. figure is 35% for the national average. Okay, so, so we got a longer lived cow, we got better constituents, we got better value out of that constituent production. Yeah and that high fertility is driving our days in milk at grass. That, that, uh, that's kind of where we are. And it's giving you a greater choice, Mark. The sustainability of that cow hanging around is giving you a greater choice when you look at whatever aspect, milk cordon or whatever you want to do to improve your herd. Okay, and, and I might get to that a little bit, because often we talk about all the time selection of bulls, selection of bulls. Talking to all of you this morning, it's really interesting about your selection of cows. So what cows to breed from? Robert, in your experience, you're doing all AI. You've looked at your herd growing and, uh, growing and developing. <coughs> Have you some rules? That what cows are you not going to breed replacements for? Absolutely. I am not breeding from temperamental cows. For they're the first thing I will not touch. Second thing is feed. Any cow with feed problem now, she might be bred, but she'll be bred to a beef bull. Okay. She's not coming back. She's not going through the herd. Cell count, if the history is there, it, it, she might be her fault or whatever, but I am not breeding a heifer from her if she has that problem in her. And it seems to like it seems to be correct, and like over the time I've been doing it, it seems to be correct in itself. My cell count is in control. Yeah, so you're exactly. constantly looking for that healthier, long-lived cow, yeah. uh, Michael. I think in your case, and I know you've been a very strong advocate of milk recording and looking at the detail in there. What is there is there criteria you use within that selection? A mother will breed a, a daughter that usually has a high cell count. There's a huge correlation. There are feed problems. You know, so that's just facts, and you can do all you like with all the breeding that you want to do. But a daughter will, once again, if she's got mm. like a, a, a problem with a sphinx or whatever it is, that genetics will follow on. So, like, that's an opportunity there for you not to breed that problem into your herd. Okay. So, so okay. There's no, it's foolish to go along and put that animal in calf to a replacement down the road where you're going to have oh, a keeper or not keeper. So, you have an opportunity there to put a beef bull on her and keep away. Okay, I look at it fairly carefully. Somatic cell count is the first thing. When the first thing comes in the door, that's what you're trying to manage. Any cow that has a somatic cell count <coughs> point of problem, you'll go along, and if it's not obvious to you, like we say, when you, mm -hmm. if it's a chronic case, you might, you'll see MT. You'll use the paddle to figure out what to do with her. So like, uh, that's why the milk corn is really important to me. And from a breeding per perspective, which you're here today, mm. I, if I have an animal with a high somatic cell count, I will not breed off her. I do not want to replace them off her, so okay. I'll put a beef bull in her straight away. And like the milk corn report is designed in such a way now that you have a hard index on the side and you can use it that way if you're not into really in-depth analysis, which I probably am, but if you're not, you've, it, it's, it's, um, you have a hard rank from one to whatever you have. 
So you can rank your cow, pick your bottom 20 yeah. and, and take them out. Have you some criteria on that you use bef uh, before you start into your breeding cycle with cows? Yeah, it'd be very similar to the lads, um, particularly Robert. We, we would pick um, certainly cows with, with, with feet, temperament and others. Now on the cell count one, what we generally find a, a problematic cow for cells mm. is, is either a free milker or she, it's a teeth problem she will have. Okay. So we would eliminate them. Um, and cells wouldn't be an issue. Um, we'd eliminate them. I suppose on, on the other side of it then, what we'd be doing for looking is the selection of the bulls. And in the selection of the bulls, uh, we'd be very particular that we're not breeding off too much off one sire. So what we do when we're picking our sires, and it, it's quite simple, and it'll keep your herd very uniform, is we never <coughs> pick more than two genomic bulls off one sire. Numbers in your head maybe, George, around uh, sort of minimum EBI we're looking for replacements from, and maybe when they calve, uh, how does that influence cow choice there as well in terms of replacements? So, so look, as a rough rule of thumb, and kind of on a national basis, Martin, we're talking maybe a threshold of around 150 EBI in the cows. So if they're mm -hmm. sub-150, maybe the, the bee fruit might be the better option for them because we're trying to accelerate genetic improvement. The genetic improvement we're making is fantastic, but let's make it greater. Let's have a, a, a more rapid increase. So sub-150 as a kind of a threshold beef, above 150 EBI, all other things being equal, calving date, mastitis, legs and all that being good, mm. we're, we're going to dairy them. And we want them calved early as well, so they need so to be calved in the first three or four weeks. Okay, yeah. so generally, I suppose as a rule, if, if, she, if, she, if she's not calved by Paddy's Day, we're not looking for a heifer even sooner than that? I would say would the first, take another? preferably the first of March. Okay. And remember, your, your heifers are a really great target audience to use for breeding the next generation as well, because they're generally better genetics <coughs> as well. But Martin, is there any logic in, in breeding replacements that's going to be born outside the month of February? Oh, uh, absolutely. Like, even absolutely if you look at the New yeah. Zealand blueprints that they would have had, they put every, okay, to, uh, the first three weeks yeah. is, all, is all AI, uh, all Frisian AI, and that's it. And then, like, she's already, she's fertile. She's already coming in the first three weeks. She's already ticking all the boxes. If you want to keep the thing very, very simple. If you don't want to get into use selection, if you breed off the ear, if you only put the early cows and calf to Frisian, you've already gone halfway down the track if you okay. don't want to go selective. As a, as a general rule. Yeah, and uh, once you get yeah. your three weeks, like if you have, even if you have a poor conception rate, even if only 50% of them go on calf and you do the first three weeks, you'll get ample replacements out of that. Like. Absolutely. And, and, and sometimes that's often the issue, Michael, is that, you know, we, 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 because herds are getting so fertile, we can breed replacements quite fast. Uh, your experience, James, in terms of selection, again, is there any rules around cow selection that, uh, that you look at when you're advising? Um, of course, and a, a lot of it depends on, on the type of farmer you're speaking to. Like speaking to these guys, you have different conversations, speaking to guys who are new to the, new to the yeah. thing. But what I would say in terms of, there is doubts in some people's minds out there about the benefits of EBI. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that's in some ways healthy because we always need to question what right. we're doing. It's ranked on an A plus B minus C payment system. So it's as accurate a figure as you can get when it comes to ranking bulls on production. Mm. Really mm. good number, the milk sub-index or production sub-index. And the other one is 33% <coughs> uh, is the fertility sub-index. And as I said earlier on, without fertility, you will not get production. So, uh, so I, I don't know any farmer in Ireland who's been paid on an A plus B minus C payment system is not looking for those two traits. Mm. Okay. So, so, so by just using, for example, in terms of selecting sires, by just using the fresh panel alone, mm. you are going to make serious progress in a short amount of time without go having to go into the, any of the real complications that some of the guys at, at the higher level are at. Okay, so <coughs> if we look at that in general, we're getting on to the sire piece, is that, you know, people say, oh God, we picked these bulls, they're, you know, they're, and the next time a proof comes out, that bull falls and all this kind of stuff, and it gets a bit of negative attention. I mean, uh, Robert, if you're looking at, at picking a team of bulls, and I understand that you're in, you use Gene Ireland program and so on, you might explain your reckoning just, just around teams. Look, uh, on, the, on the point you made, you're going to take hits with the EBI, like there's bulls that do fall off the scale. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing, they don't leave bad cows behind them. Mm. That's yeah. the first thing. They're, not, mm. they're way higher standard than a stock bull heifer or a bad cow. Tell me your right. really good line, if you remember it well, about your view of that stock bull piece versus the EBI. Well, it's, it's, it's something I, I, I said before, I learned it a long time ago. The best stock bull is not as good as the worst AI bull. Okay. And I stick to it as, I, I just couldn't. Well, we're gonna nail, yeah. we're gonna nail you to the mast on that one. Well, I'll Robert. stand behind Very it because well, it absolutely, it, it okay. just, it just doesn't, you just don't have to think about it. Take, we're all here, we've all put out bull calves being tested this year, right? 
and they've come back, they haven't made it, right? Yeah. So you can imagine the ones that haven't made it that I have seen, right, in my herd, I would take them as decently good calves, right? Okay. Good calves. So you can imagine the ones that have made it, like, okay. they have to be better, like, so. Any comments, Michael? Yeah, well yeah comments on, on, on I, the I, risk I, in here. I do my own. I'm DIY AI, so I could have up to 17 bulls in the tank every year. Now, to explain, it sounds like a lot of bulls, right? Okay. I'll, I'll pick 10 bulls that I want to use, right? Yeah. And then there's seven bulls that I'll get from the Gene Ireland program, right? But every, I'll, the most I'll pick is 10 straws from each bull. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, the reality is with a 66 or 7 or 8% conception rate, I'll only end up with three or four heifers from any bull at most coming into my herd. So she can be a superstar. She can run the 100 mm -hmm. meters there in, in 11 seconds. I don't, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But she still would be a really good performer. And even if she has issues with, with temperament or something like that, it's only four heifers. It's not going to break my heart like. But still, I'm spreading the risk across the herd. And the other thing, which was brought up earlier on, it's very important as well that you don't fall in love with any particular sire. You know what I mean? So have a good range of bulls in the tank. Have a good even team. Like, you know what mm. I mean? Have a good range. And also as well, if you're into more into depth, try and avoid bulls bred by the same sire. Like, you know, you get every year we get a, a bull that breeds a whole lot of new bulls, right? Uh, young bulls onto the scene. Yeah. Try and only use one or two of them. Spread the risk. Okay, spread so, it out. so spreading the risk is a message. It's really important. Okay. We, we, we've been fortunate enough, we've been doing it for the last 10 or 12 years out of sheer interest, and it served me well. I never fell in love with any bull because I thought it was a risk, a risk in the overall scheme of things, and it's really served our herd well in the long run that we don't get huge fluctuations now because George, who's very good at the figures, when you do the probability on it, yeah. if you use a range of bulls, the probability is very, very small, and you're up to 95%. That maybe a little bit for us. I suppose the big, the big thing, Martin, to remember is that on average, about th a third of the calves born on any individual farm nationally are sired by one bull, and that's, that's too big a risk to spread. So we need to mm -hmm. use biggish teams. 100 cows and heifers use about seven bulls. 200 cows and heifers use about 14 bulls. You won't go too far astray. And use them evenly is the other thing. So from the breeding advisor's point of view, is that part of your role? Because some people are not going to have the confidence to go and look at this. They're, this is a big chunk of work that they're not familiar with. Mm. Is that part of your role as a breeding advisor that you can look at this for them? I think it's part of a role as a breeding organization. Okay. Um, because, and this is why um, the Fresh program is so attractive, because there's, a, there's a 9, 12 bulls in the Fresh program. They're changed every day. There's different pedigrees there, etc. And they're all selected on production sub-index and fertility mm. sub-index. And the, the, farmers, the farmer unknowns to himself is using a whole uh, spread of bulls, spreading his risk as he goes through the breeding season, unknowns to himself. So to me, all of this, like these guys are a credit to, you know, they're an example to, to any farmer in Ireland, but yes. an awful lot of guys, have no, I'm not saying they have no interest in it, but they either haven't got the technical expertise or they haven't got the, the time to put into selecting bulls. Absolutely, so yeah. we do it for them, we do, we, we plan out the, what, fresh, fresh, what bulls are going in the fresh program and we do all the sire advice for them. And the, sire, the key thing about sire advice, in my view, more than anything else, and I agree with Owen in terms of it's, it's, it's like uh, high production to low production cows, except nice complementary matings, but the key thing is inbreeding. Yeah. And, and okay. the sire advice will do the inbreeding for you, and, you'll, and, and I would say to you, with a lot of confidence, just do them two things, fresh program, sire advice, and you'll be, breed a hell of a profitable herd of cows over a few years. Okay. Just, sorry, just to support yeah. what James is saying, the, the only thing then that that farmer has to do is pick out the cows that he doesn't want to put in calf to exactly, AI. Yeah. So when the farmer, okay, when the AI technician yeah. comes into the yard, he spend that two minutes is all he has to do yeah. or she has to do to say, well, that one gets a beef one. No matter how much of a hurry he's in, she gets a beef and that's it. Yeah. Okay. And that's the most okay. important and we thing we that you do. To the beef. Just on one thing, we'll say for the guy that does want to breed his own replacements that hasn't been doing it, yeah. there's two big things that, that both Michael and George have said. One thing Michael has said is hugely important. If you breed your replacements in your first three mm -hmm. to four weeks, mm -hmm. you're automatically breeding your most fertile cow on your <laughs> farm. So that replacement is going to be the most fertile. And if you're a farmer that wants to, we'll say, eliminate whatever each of us have said, that's the bad cow, we'll say, or the cow that has a slight health problem, you eliminate her out. <laughs> now, George mentioned 150 of an EBI cutoff point. <coughs> For a lot of herds, that might be their better cows. Yep. Mm. And there is, there is huge bulls out there for a 150 EBI code that will improve her. Yep. So I mean, if you're, if you're a herd that's concerned about biosecurity and you don't want to go buying your replacement stock, if you can take out your, 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 your codes, you don't want to breed legs, others, temperament, 
And if you can breed for the first three to four weeks, you're automatically breeding your most fertile cow yeah. and breed her to your high EBI bull, whether it's fresh or whatever, mm -hmm. you mm. will, in a couple of years, make huge gains in your heart. Okay. And it, it is to do that. It's, it's, it's not to be tempted. And Michael said about the, the, the falling in love with a bull. Don't fall in love with a cow in your herd and breed her three or four times yeah, to get I, a heifer off her because she's not a fertile yeah. cow. Sure, yeah. sure, absolutely. But now, yeah, we, we've one important group of animals that we haven't spoken about. It's our heifers. heifers yeah. Yeah. It's right. absolute lunacy. The best genetics that you have mm. in your herd are your heifers. Mm. Breed, like if you're, you're the best animal you're going to get is a heifer out of a heifer. Now, God rest my dad, this was a policy we had. We always bred our heifers to the best stock we possibly could. And this is what grew, this is what made exponential leaps for really us. It really speeds it up, Michael. It speeds yeah. the whole thing up. So we're going to go back to the start of the conversation here. If you have compact cabin, you've moved from that. By the time you get to May, when you really have to focus on your heifers to get them in calf, you're no longer rearing calves. You're pretty mm -hmm. much, all your calves at this stage are either sold or they're, they're reared. Mm -hmm. You've already moved on to a very important uh, 20 days. Whether you do synchronization, fixed time AI, or you watch them as, the, as they're coming bull and with, with vasectomized bulls, which I highly recommend for heifers. Mm -hmm. You give them one opportunity to go and calf to AI, they're up to size, you've all the work done before that. There is no reason with heifers that you shouldn't be getting 80% conception rate to heifers if the AI is done correctly, and thankfully we're getting it every year, and there's no reason why Super. not. Just, just, just a quick no round. Brand. Breeding heifers, are you sync, vasectomized? How, how, how do you uh, at at home, I'm, synch I'm synchronizing, and synchronizing. I would say in the, uh, the, one of the biggest improvements or developments that's happened over the last three or four years is the success of synchronization program on heifers. Okay. Not, not, and I agree completely with Michael in terms of your breeding or your best genetics, but for okay. me as a farmer, it just takes all the, 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 the pain in the ass workload out of getting heifers in and out the, the item. And in the next panel, we'll kind of explore yeah. synchronization and so on. Yourself, Robert, what's your system with your heifers? I just serve them as they come. They're, they, 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 I bring them home to the yard to the yard, and they stay at home for the three weeks. Then I have teaser bulls with them, and I still AI them through mm. like to the finish because okay. I don't have a bull on the farm. Michael? It might sound very workload, but I, I actually AI them uh, natural service for 20 days. They're, no, they're on an out farm, right? So I have two <laughs> bulls with them. With, with uh, chin balls on them, two vasectomized sorry, well, two yeah, balls with right, chin yeah. balls on them, two different colours. Trust me, when they're bull and you spot them from Mars, like you know what I mean. We only go see okay, them. You know, you only see yeah, them. I only service. see them once a day at ten o'clock in the day. By the time we've all the work done, we get up there at ten o'clock, and it takes me maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Well, the reality is that's thirty hours over the year. Mm. Mm. Like yeah, that's well all it is for twenty days. It 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 pays me back multifold, and it okay. makes no and and that's why also as well. The other trick of the trade is with the vasectomized bulls, let them off two or three weeks before the breeding season starts. Don't let them off the day you're starting, because everything will be bull. You yeah, understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, get them relaxed, yeah, get them yeah, settled get down, settled put the chin balls on them the day before you start. And it is simple to pick them up bull. It's okay. no, you'll have no okay. problem whatsoever. Oh it's yeah, we're, we're very, very similar. We, we do go one step further, as in we, we put the scratch guards on the heifers. <coughs> we put the, the spray on glue scratch guard on the heifer three weeks beforehand. Mm. So when we go to see them every day, we just write them down in the notebook. When we start breeding, we don't need to have all the heifers in the one bunch. Gotcha. So the first 10 that we're bulling, we'll put with the vasectomized bull. And the one trick we do, and we find it hugely helpful, the day she's served, we don't put her back with them again. She goes to a different paddock. So your, your vasectomized bull is only with the heifers that are coming in bulling. So the day she is served, she's moved to a different paddock. Okay, and that way... How many groups have you got then? So um, we'll, yeah. we'll, we, we would only have... We, we could bring half them home or we could bring them all yep. home. It doesn't matter. But what we do then is, the most important thing is the day she served, move her somewhere else. Okay. Because when you're going okay. to a paddock the following day, you're only looking at a vasectomized bull with a marked heifer. Mm. So she's not, she's not the, the one that was done yep. the day before, the day before is gone. Okay. So so just, some to, just something I, just I do at the end now, in, yeah. when you have, the, we'll say, the middle of the heifers, the, we'll say 15 or 20 of them gone, I'll put them with the cows. With the milking cows, Remaining just ones. no. Put them, put them with the milking cows, and they'll come. I, I guarantee you. The only heifers after a few days, it's hardship for a few days. But after a few days, the only heifers that'll ever be in the connecting yard are the ones the bullet. The okay, rest so th it's really back. interesting, guys, yeah. because all of these slightly different systems, right? But the one thing I think for anyone listening to it is, there's lots of ways of skinning yeah. skin this cat, and a lot of people get, oh my god, I have to synchronize them. Oh my god, I have to do this, whatever. But there's actually, you can really make this suit your system. Is, is, is well, the reality, right? like, the, all I would say is we have them on an out farm now. It's very handy if you had them at home. We used to have them at home until home got maximised, right? So they're on an out farm. And that's not stopping me AI them. So that's the bottom line. It's yeah, not stopping, and it's not stopping me getting yeah. a successful conception rate. And so there's ways and means of getting the heifers in calf. And if, for me, whether you do, 
fix time AI, whether you inject them after seven, eight, nine days, whatever you do, if, or you go the full 20 days to get, or 21 days, whatever it is. If that length of time is not worth the investment in the long run, I don't know what you're doing in your business to make the thing work better and make more money. Okay. We're, we're going to change gear a little bit, right? We're going to think about the cows we're not going to breed replacements from, and what are we going to do with those? Uh, George, you might give a bit of an, a helicopter view of the dairy beef index, <laughs> how we're looking at in terms of getting the value cap. Okay, so the bottom line in the dairy beef index is the higher the, the DBI, the more profit that calf will generate for the dairy farmer and for the beef farmer. We split it down the middle, half it's valued around gestation length and calving interval, the other half is around confirmation and beef calf is, calf is valued. So from a dairy farmer's perspective, we're looking for re reasonably easy calving and, and good gestation length. We've got to tailor it to the cow we're putting it on. So mature cows, maybe we look a little bit, we can be more uh, relaxed about the calving uh, difficulty piece. We're looking for reliability though for both the younger cows and for the older cows as well. So very, so you're really looking at this DBI index, uh, you're looking at the panel of beef bulls available to you. You're looking at the calving ease, negative on gestation length. We're looking at a positive and carcass weight in there. Yeah. And we're looking for high reliability behind the calving difficulty figure. That's kind of a, a very short sum. And unlike, the, unlike maybe the, the dairy side of the house, we probably don't need to use a massive team of bulls. <coughs> two, two codes for two or three is probably enough for most. Most of us keeping our heads at any one time when we're selecting the bulls. Okay, Owen, are, 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 how are you handling the beef side? Yeah, yeah, we're exactly the same. I, I guess we ha we have a mop up um, Hereford bull that that runs, but he he we wouldn't work him until we're six weeks into breeding. So for yep. the first six weeks, everything is AIs because <laughs> the numbers are too big. So what we do is the bulls, the cows that are selected out for different reasons that are to get beef, they're on the they're on the the dairy beef um, Gene Ireland program. We get two Hereford bulls and we get one Angus bull. Um, what we do with them then, they're all AI'd with them. Any second calver or an older cow, we'll put the Angus on. So we're eliminating the calving risk that is associated with using the, the dairy the beef test index. Bulls. The yeah, test bulls. The test bulls, okay. And the rest of them then, we'll get, we'll get the Herefords. The one thing we have found with them, um, uh, them bulls is the calving, uh, the calving interval is very short. They'll calve, they'll put out calves to you two weeks beforehand and they're fine calves like that. Now, from our own farm point of view, we have uh, a farmer, a beef farmer that buys all of our um, bull calves off the farm, all of our beef bull calves, and he'll buy maybe 10 to 15 of our Frisian bull calves off the farm. So we want to keep him. He's not going to stay with us if we're going to have poor quality beef calves on the farm. Um, the rest of the beef calves then are carried through to three to four weeks of age and we sell them in the local market okay. in Milton. Okay. Similar, I think, Mike, yourself, you're using Gene Ireland. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm a supporter of the Gene Ireland dairy. dairy, dairy be, yeah, and, dairy and, and I yeah. find as, year, as time goes on, the quality calves are getting better and better and better. Like they're smashing yeah. calves. Now, it's all Angus I use, and I'd use a, a very similar strategy as well. That if she was a handy size second lactation animal, I wouldn't take the risk on her. I'd use one of the proven bulls that the, the lads here in Munster have. Uh, or progressive have, and I'd use one of those proven ones that I'd know. So I'd always, uh, outside of the, the, the Gene Ireland program, I'd always have one other Angus bull in the tank, okay. that just to be sure, it's already proven, like that, that George was talking about, That's very and it ticks, all, it ticks yeah. all the boxes. So yeah. just, you know, she's a handy little one, and she's still growing, you know what I mean? She's still is growing away from cow. first, second yeah. lactation, you have to give her a chance. So. That's the only, that's the only fine Okay, so it's a real key point there for, for, for people listening. It, you know, again, it's managing risk. We have a highly reliable calve and difficulty that we can see in those bulls in the panel. Like I, I do six, sorry, I just, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I do, ahead, Michael, yeah. we do uh, nine weeks of AI. I do, I do about 23, 24 days of Frisian, and then it's all Angus after that. So I pretty much cover the whole season. I literally, I season. you know, I cover the whole, yeah. the mop up bull, because he wouldn't get much work now. Yeah. Yeah. Like Same for you, Robert, I think, is it? Yeah, I'm all AI, like, I'm all AI, and I'd have to say, from listening to this, the one thing that I'd stress is the cavities for those bulls is vital, because they're the later cows yeah. that's calving. They're the ones you want to go back in calf quick. Yes. Like, so if you put a wrong, beef bull into those cows, you're right into the, uh, your the exit, you're showing them the exit door really. If okay. they have a, like okay. I said it, I said it on the interview there, like when I got, I have been down, I have a hundred cows calved, that have been in the yard in the middle of the night four times having a hundred mm -hmm. cows. Mm -hmm. That's the standard I set. Like mm -hmm. Okay, or else you're just inclined yeah. Robert to stay in bed. I can support <laughs> what Robert, on you. I can support <laughs> Robert said. And I, I bench my ear, on a, sorry, I bench my ear on how many times I have to get out of bed in the night time. Really? Yes, okay. I'm, I'm down to two times on average over the last six, seven years. 
Yeah. And the oh, one thing I, I, I suppose, look, I started off in veterinary in the 90s. Sections were, were what we did. Yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a big thing. I, I think the one thing that started out a huge amount of calving difficulty has, be, has been the breeding piece. Mm -hmm. Last word on, on DBI, James. Yeah, look, at it's, it's, uh, it's something I think as an industry, as a dairy industry, we're going to have to take more uh, responsibility for. And, and not even from a, self, uh, from a selfish point of view, because we, we, we need to be fairly uh, confident that we're going to have a market for higher genetic merit calves as time goes on, and there's more beef comes out of the dairy herd. And the, the good news is that there's really, and a lot of think the lads have, have testified to this, there's really good Angus and Hereford bulls in, uh, in NCBC uh, presently. Now, the one thing I would say is, just in terms of gestation length, like uh, the difference between using maybe a, 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 a Hereford or a limousine bull, stock bull on your herd versus a very short gestation bull like you were talking about on, it could be two to three weeks. Now that's two to three weeks milk. Now that's a lot of money. There's a lot of money in that. And there's that lull right at the moment. I think a lot of people are in this lull yeah. because the stock bull has come in. We, uh, we might have continued AIing, but also where gestation length is actually, you know, is creeping. Mm -hmm. So look, I, I mean, I think in general, the, 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 what I'm taking from, from, from the DVI is use the reliability on the calving difficulty. If you're worried, make sure it's all proven. If you're looking at Gene Ireland, be careful about your, your, your cow selection there and encourage everybody in dairy, encourage for positive carcass. Exactly. In, in the, so that we give benefit to that beef farmer exactly. and the return customer. Guys, we've talked about an awful lot here. Uh, what I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to thank <laughs> you all. Uh, it's been a super discussion. There's loads of stuff we haven't talked about. We'll pick up the discussion on sex and so on in the second panel. Uh, I just want to thank, thank you all for, for me, from everybody here, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.